Dr. John McCain. October 1967, on the lake of Chukbak, the people and the civil militia arrested a major, American major, John McCain, who was shot down with the American planes A4B1. Uh, it was shot down near the electricity, near the power plant, Yen Fu. During the day, 10 American planes were shot down during the same day. John McCain, when he came here, he erected this monument. That is a picture from Hanoi and the voices of Mr. Hung, who was a C-SPAN minder while we were there the whole uh, four days in Hanoi. But that is a, a monument to John McCain or on behalf of John McCain. But John <laughs> McCain's here with us. You tell us, what is that? What are we looking at? I've never understood that, Brian. And I visited it when I went to uh, Hanoi sometime in the 70s. I think around the middle 70s that was built. And I'm not sure exactly why. Uh, but I have gone to visit it. and. Um, they, uh, uh, of course, there's a few mistakes there. Like USAF, I was in the Navy, and they called me a major, and I was a lieutenant commander. But uh, why they erected it and what significant it has to them, I have never really quite figured out. I uh, complained a couple of times when I heard that the grass was overgrown and there might have been some bird droppings uh, around it, and uh, and they thought I was serious, <laughs> so I didn't complain anymore. Were you shot down right around <laughs> right there? in that lake. I, I went down right in that lake, and as he mentioned, the thermal power plant, the electricity plant we were bombing, and I was hit right over the target. In fact, I was in a dive, so when I ejected, I landed right in that lake, and uh, that's obviously why they, they, they put it up there, and as you know, I was badly injured, and uh, they swam out and pulled me in, and... Uh, I can tell you the natives were less than friendly <laughs> upon my arrival because, uh, and understandably so, we had just finished bombing their, their city, you know, I mean, I, I don't hold any grudge against them because of that, but uh, sometime in the 70s they built that, uh, that particular uh, memorial and uh, frankly I'm very glad to say I don't have any other memorials anywhere else. <laughs> How many times have you been back there? Just twice. I went back once in 1985 with Walter Cronkite and the CBS film crew uh, on the 10th anniversary of the fall of Saigon, and I was there for like two days. And then last March, Phil Graham and I, March a year ago, uh, Phil Graham and I went back for a few days, and uh, we visited it uh, again, and we also went down to Saigon. You know, everybody calls it Saigon now, as you know from being there. Is it hard to go back? No. No. You know, Brian, it was a long time ago. Uh, I have many Vietnamese friends who, who were on the other side, in other words, on our side. There's no reason for me to hold a grudge or anger. There's certainly some individual Vietnamese, some of the guards that were very cruel and inflicted a lot of pain on me and others, but uh, there's no sense in me hating Vietnamese. Uh, when, as you know from, and all of us know who have visited Vietnam, the Vietnamese people are very basically decent, gentle people. You know, and uh, a victim throughout history, um, partially due to geography of uh, oppression and uh, wars that have gone on for a couple of thousand years, or either or being occupied by another country such as the Chinese and then the French, Japanese, French, and then of course. So uh, I hold no ill will towards them. I don't admire the communist system. I don't like it. I think they are going to fall sooner or later, just as you know the rest of communism is falling throughout the world. But overall, I hold no personal grudges. Let's go over some of the, just the statistics. Uh, you were in the Navy for how many years? A uh, total of 22 years. From when to when? From 19, I graduated from the Naval Academy in 1958, and I left the Navy in early 1981. When did the plane go down? October 26, 1967. I was hit by a surface-to-air missile over the city of Hanoi, as I mentioned. We were bombing the thermal power plant. It was the first time we had bombed a target inside of Hanoi and as many of our listener viewers will remember 
they were very heavily defended, the city of Hanoi. They had rings of surface-to-air missiles. I counted eight surface-to-air missiles in the air headed roughly in my direction, and one of them, one of them hit me. How badly were you injured? Broke uh, both arms and my leg on ejection because I was in the dive when I was hit by the surface-to-air missile, and then uh, when I was pulled out, my shoulder was badly damaged by a rifle butt, and I was bayoneted a couple of times. As I mentioned to you, they were quite, <laughs> quite restless. Fortunately for me, the, the Army came up and picked me up, put me in a truck, and took me. It was a very, it was a five-minute ride to the prison. And, and may I say that that's another example of waste of the taxpayers' dollars. I'd gone to four different escape and evasion schools, and here I was shot down in the center of Hanoi in a five-minute ride to the prison. So. It was all that training went, uh, was for naught. Again, how many years were you in the prison? Five prisons? and a half years. And how many years in how many different prisons? I was uh, in three different prisons. One was the, uh, that we called the plantation that, that you have, are taking, have taken films of. And the other was the old French prison, which we we're also, I think we're going to see later on, called Wallo, which means in English, rough translation, furnace of fire, I understand which was built by the French in 1943, and that's a real prison. Uh, and then we were taken out to a punishment camp for about uh, nine months in 1970 because we had uh, had, uh, we actually wanted to have church services and the Vietnamese had taken about 24 of us. Then we were taken back and again back to Wallow Prison where I stayed until we were released. And remember that in 1969 and 70, or particularly in 1970, the treatment of the Vietnamese of the prisoners changed dramatically. And we could, there's a lot of theories as to why, but we went from basically solitary confinement or two or three to a cell to large cells of 45 or 50 in each. It was a dramatic and, by the way, wonderful change in, in the treatment. How many prisoners of war are there in the United States Congress? And there, are, there is none in the Senate. There are two others in the House, Pete Peterson and Sam Johnson. Sam Johnson from Texas, Pete Peterson from Florida. Did you know either one? Very well, both. Yep. But, uh, Sam Johnson much better than Pete Peterson, but I knew them, knew them both, yes. Is Sam Johnson, I mean, uh, Pete Peterson's a Democrat. Yes, and, and Sam, Sam Johnson, Johnson, Republican. Yes. Uh, is there anything about being in prison that makes you a Republican or a Democrat? <laughs> uh, I, I think that... Um, that there was some resentment back in 1968 when Lyndon Johnson stopped the bombing. Uh, we assumed that there would be some accommodation made for the POWs because, you know, we were up there bombing, we were captured, then he stopped the bombing. And uh, there was resentment about that. Uh, and also, I think there was, in the 1971 72 period, there was much more encouragement and help to the families by the Nixon administration than there had been before. Now, we could go into the reasons for that, but there was clearly more help for the families at that time. So, uh, I, but also, as you know, uh, military people have a tendency to be more conservative. We have a map here. And this map shows Indochina and uh, and Vietnam, of course, mm -hmm. just so we can get a rough overview of where you where were the where was the carrier that you were flying from in here. We were uh, actually we were further north than that. We would be most very f not too far from Haiphong. Can you see Haiphong there? On sure, the map? it's right in there. We would stay up fairly close. In fact, some of our raids, uh, bombing missions, we would go on would be 45-minute missions. Take off from the ship, 15 minutes to to the shore, drop and, and return. So because there was really no real threat to the ships uh, out in the Tonkin Gulf, we sometimes stayed fairly close to the North Vietnamese coast. I want to show the audience, too, so for perspective, where this is. If you go right up here, you're talking about being in China, right there, mm -hmm. and right in there. And you come down, and you're into the North Vietnam or the Hanoi area, Haiphong being right there. Mm -hmm. And then on the other side, of course, is Laos. Yes. And if you move area. over to Thailand, Thailand uh, right you there. will see that the Air Force bases were up near the Vietnamese border. Up here? And, yes, and uh, places like uh, Udorn and uh, oh, Uban, some others, and the Air Force would fly out of those bases into, and also some from South Vietnam, into Hanoi and Haiphong. And you can see that they were very long missions that the Air Force had to fly as compared with ours, where the ships would be right, right off the coast. And for a long time during the war, Vietnam was basically divided in a line north-south, basically about through Hanoi. And the Air Force had the responsibility for those to the, 
on the Thailand side, on the western side, and the Navy uh, a lot on the eastern side. Although later in the war, we went on coordinated strikes with the Air Force. 17th parallel about right there. Yes. Which yeah. meant that this was north and this yes. was south. Yes. We've got some videotape, uh, Senator McCain, of a B-52 crash site that has mm -hmm. kind of become a mini tourist area over in Hanoi. Not many Americans have been there. Have you been there? By the way, this is the neighborhood. I have not been there. I've seen pictures of it before. Remember that the B-52s did not fly north until the Christmas bombing of 1972. And there were uh, a number of B-52s, I think 10 or 12, that were shot down during that Christmas period. But it was an incredible display of firepower and basically had taken out the Vietnamese ability to defend themselves at least as far as airstrikes are concerned. We show this because we wanted to show you the neighborhood and you see pictures of this from time to time. This is a day in April that was about 100 degrees and this in the middle of that swamp there with houses around it is wreckage from a B-52 that they um, as a matter of fact, you got to pay a little money to get back down oh, this side. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> it's a free enterprise system at work, huh? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Take a little car back in this area, but they let us shoot. This didn't, it didn't cost much, I can tell you that. <laughs> Any reaction when you see a chunk well, of American B-52? Well, not particularly, except to hope that the crew obviously would had gotten out. Uh, and also, I, I must say that. You could make an argument that the B-52s were not used correctly during the Vietnam War. They bombed the jungles and the Ho Chi Minh Trail, whereas once they were sent north, they had a devastating effect, Brian. I mean, they just literally took out the, uh, the air defenses of, uh, of North Vietnam, where we had been using tactical air, not totally very successfully uh, in the past. B-52 is, uh, is an awesome weapon uh, of war, and I noted with some interest that uh, that some of them were used even in the Persian Gulf effort. And what was the difference in the size of your plane, say, and the size of this plane? I think, uh, of course, it was like 1 50th the size, but perhaps more importantly than that, the bomb load of a A-4 that I was flying was generally about seven or eight bombs, and of course, I don't know how many hundreds go, come off of a B-52. The firepower that a B-52 could bring to bear is very impressive. And the first few nights, it was very dangerous for the B-52s, until they took out the air defenses, a number of them were shot down, as you know. This is in the middle of Hanoi, if you've just joined us. Our guest is Senator John McCain, Republican of Arizona, who was a prisoner of war for five and a half years. We're going to show some videotape in a moment from the prison cell where he, actually two of the three places where he was located while he was there. And this is in um, uh, a neighborhood that's uh, fairly easy to get to. But I, I guess one of the things that uh, people want to know is if we actually build bomb civilians during the war. You know, we didn't, Brian, and it's coming out more and more that we did not. There was a famous incident of a so-called Back Mai Hospital, which was a hospital in Hanoi, which, which supposedly struck with all these casualties, and, and it turned out that was not the case. There was precision bombing, and the civilian casualties were minimal, and the Vietnamese will even admit that now. But at the same time, I, we've got, I've got to add that whenever you're in a war, civilians are going to be hurt. If civilians were not injured and there weren't civilian casualties, war would be a much more attractive kind of a business. And so uh, the, the casualties were minimal, but unfortunately, innocent civilians were killed. You have any idea how much this B-52 cost? I know, and they've been in such, they've been in service for how long? You know, they've been in since the 50s, and they have turned out to be an incredible workhorse because they were originally designed to a large degree as a strategic bombers. You know, to, to carry just nuclear weapons, and they turned into a conventional uh, carrier. Um, I do not know the cost, but I would say to duplicate something like, you know, that which is the B-2, you're talking about a billion dollars a copy. I think that the B-2 uh, B-52 was a very worthwhile investment and I have great admiration for the crews that flew the B-52s because you know they flew straight and level and depended on their electronic countermeasures whereas at least in a tactical airplane you can dodge. That's a plaque by the way on the wall there you can see right down there mm -hmm. in the lower left hand corner where it says 52 which mm -hmm. is fairly obvious what it is. Mm -hmm. and that's a plaque on the wall right near the site where you can go and tourists can go in Hanoi. They seem